Welcome, everybody. We'll have a brief discussion. No? Can somebody work on the mic a little bit? Εγώ πιο μακριά. Τώρα ακούγεται καλύτερα. Okay, welcome everybody. We'll have a brief or not so brief discussion, conversation with the ambassador of the United States in Greece. Um, he asked me to make a brief opening remark and I guess I'll have to give him the floor. Uh, there are some seats on that side. Oh, there were. Okay, ambassador, please go ahead. Good. Well, Kalimera, first of all, thank you, Tom, for doing this. We have a little bit of a road show now. I feel like we're one of those Las Vegas acts. Um, but I, it really is an enormous pleasure for me to be back here um, at Delphi. I want to start with huge congratulations to Simeon and, and to the organizers for what I think has become a very important institution of the, the Greek political calendar. As I was getting ready for today, um, and this is my third one of these. In, in that three Delphi forums, there have been millions of words and thousands of tweets and, and many, many cups of Taft coffee. But I, I was trying to reflect, you know, what's, how does this feel different compared to 2000, 2017 or, or 2018? So I, I just wanted to set the table with a couple of reflections on that. And as I, as I cr tried to crystallize my thoughts, I think the most important point is that Greece is back. Um, Greece is back as a foreign policy actor um, in the region. The most visible manifestation of that, of course, is the Prespice Agreement and the opportunities that that has opened up for further progress in setting all of the countries of the Western Balkans on their path towards the Euro-Atlantic community but also in terms of unlocking the untapped economic potential especially of connectivity between Thessaloniki and the larger Balkan neighborhood uh, to restore Thessaloniki's historic role as this cosmopolitan crossroads, the gateway for commerce, for energy, uh, for connectivity and technology um, between the Balkans and the rest of the world. Extremely important. Um, but that's by far, uh, far from the only manifestation of this. Greece is back in terms of the East Med. You see that in the thriving Greece-Israel relationship, uh, the very successful um, Greece-Israel-Cyprus trilateral, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. You see it in terms of Greece's role as an energy hub, um, probably one of the issues that has seen the most dramatic evolution during my three years here. Um, the completion of the TAP pipeline, the commencement of work on the IGB pipeline, the completion of the expansion of Rebethusa's terminal and the ability that that has created to take deliveries of American and, and other LNG. Um, most importantly, all of these projects will also help not only to deepen energy security in Greece, but also to unlock the Balkan energy island for all of the countries to the north of Greece that are 100% dependent today on Gazprom and Russia's use of energy as a political weapon. Greece is the key to unlocking that situation. And then Greece's increasingly important role in regional security. Our counterterrorism cooperation is as close as it's ever been. Uh, Greece uh, cooperates closely with the United States in terms of our NATO platforms, the work we do together at Suda Bay, the way in, re in which Greece and America work together on maritime domain awareness and security in the Eastern Med um, and the Aegean at a moment when great power competition has returned to the Eastern Med in a way that we have not seen for more than two decades. So all of this plays into the, the vision that I talked about here at Delphi, I think the first time that I was doing one of these conversations, and that's the role of Greece as a pillar of regional stability. But I think that, that vision today is more valid than ever before. Uh, we have work to do on the economic side, and Tom and I will talk about that. And then the, the, the flip side of Greece being back is that, is that America is back. Um, you saw that at the Thessaloniki International Fair, which I think will be remembered as a real watershed moment in the U.S.-Greece relationship, and especially our relationship with Northern Greece. Um, you saw that in the launch of the strategic dialogue by Secretary of State Pompeo and Foreign Minister Katrugalos in December. And the, active efforts that both governments are making uh, to sustain that momentum, continue working in those, in those lanes. 
And then you see it in the promulgation of a new American policy for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, which is one of the projects that Wes Mitchell, our former Assistant Secretary of State, uh, really prioritized, and among other things, that has set the stage for American participation in the three plus, three plus one, as we call it, the trilateral Greece, Israel, Cyprus, now with an American chair. And then finally, you see it in the very robust American presence at the Delphi Forum this year. And I'm extremely proud that we have so many colleagues from Washington. I'm not sure there's anybody left on DuPont Circle today. <laughs> But it's fantastic to have such a strong presence of the American policy community and the transatlantic policy community here at Delphi. So, Tom, that's, that's the big thing. And now you can try to, to the, the small one. go to the small. Thank you for the compliment. Um, you uh, usually, we hear all these big ideas and uh, presentations with a philosophical undertone. Let's get down to the real thing. You talk about investment, the need of investment, U.S. investment. American companies are private companies. They cannot follow the rules, the, the um, encouragement of, uh, or the decision actually of a Chinese government or a Russian government or another government. They will make their own decisions. But can you point or explain or show us some specific cases of American firms that are bidding, are involved, have invested, will invest? in real tangible terms what U.S. interest and involvement as far as the economy of Greece is concerned are there? So let me, let me answer that two ways. First of all, concretely, um, you know, you, we can point to a number of specific successes, but what I would emphasize is how much the atmospherics have changed. When I was getting ready for this job three years ago, and as ambassadors designate do, I asked the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to arrange a roundtable for me with American companies interested in Greece. Nobody came. Zero companies. Nobody wanted to look at Greece because they were worried about Grexit. They were worried about the risk that the banking system was going to implode. They were worried about uncertainty as to whether or not the Syriza government would comply with its conditionality obligations. Today we had at the Thessaloniki Fair, um, thanks in large part to our partners at the American Chamber of Commerce, and I'm glad CMOS is here, more than 50 top American companies, all of whom spent a considerable sum of money to be present in Greece because they saw the opportunities here, they saw the opportunities that TIFF represented to talk to not just a market of 10 million in Greece, but a larger market of 30 million. And I think that's a theme that we will continue to emphasize. We have specific successes we can point to, like the Onyx investment in the Ciro shipyard, like Hyatt and Marriott expanding their presence here, Avis, Lime scooters in a small way. The other point I will make, um, and especially since we're in central Greece, I, sh I should add this. I had the opportunity last week, exactly a week ago, I was in Lamia and Carpenisi, uh, along with Governor Bakoyanis. I was incredibly inspired, encouraged by the team effort that Governor Bakayanis put together, and it really crossed political lines. There were PASOK individuals, there were people from New Democracy, but it was a, a team of 30 and 40-somethings who were focused on how to get things done. And um, Governor Bakoyanis also took me while we were in Lamia to see a couple of companies that were successful, both in the agro-food sector. And um, one of these companies was actually founded just a few years ago. It was founded at the peak of the crisis but it's now growing and investing and expanding. And it's actually, it's, it's a natural partner for the work that the embassy has been doing to encourage Greek entrepreneurship to support the startup sector. I always say it's the biggest secret story of the Greek economic crisis is how underneath that crisis, the Greek startup sector has surged forward. I know Bloomberg and others have reported on the, the thousands of companies, startups, Greek startups that have registered. That reflects both the enormous potential, the human capital that this country possesses, but also the fact that in the aftermath of the crisis, the old business structures are being replaced, and they're being replaced from the grassroots, including in a lot of cases, not in Athens, but from Thessaloniki or in Lamia or in other cities in Patra, where you've got a thriving uh, startup community. These are stories that I think we all need to do a better job of getting out because that's what will attract American investment interest. 
One big issue that you've dealt with is uh, energy. <clears throat> you talked about Greece becoming a hub, although sometimes we think we are the center of the world and we are the hub, and that's a little bit too much. But anyway, uh, we do have LNGs from the US. Can you be a little bit more detailed in your analysis as far as IGB, TAP, and also given the latest with ExxonMobil in the Cypriot DEZ, the possibility of uh, either LNG again or building the East Med pipeline. What, uh, what's the prospect there? And how does the U.S. view that? We have an, an idea from the European Union, but how the U.S. views that? Well, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I should emphasize the long-standing American support for strengthening diversity of sources and routes for energy in Europe. Um, and if you look at the European energy market today, Maybe aside from Poland, Greece is probably the most dynamic national marketplace where you are seeing real progress in terms of achieving energy independence. We have Ambassador Morningstar here this weekend. Dick Morningstar has been working on the Southern Gas Corridor for more than 20 years. Um, this year, the TAP pipeline, the last leg of the Southern Corridor, will be completed. Um, and it's completed because of work which began under a new democracy government and was sustained under a series of government. In fact, a series of government which today play, has, has been playing an active role in convincing the Italian government, also of the left, to, to do their part of the work to make sure the TAP is finished on time. So TAP is extremely important. Um, I would also note um, the upstream possibilities in Greece, the fact that you have ExxonMobil not only conducting exploration off of Cyprus, but they also, ExxonMobil has a partnership with Total and Alpe for exploration south of Crete. Uh, we're very hopeful that Minister Stathakis will um, complete the last bit of paperwork associated with that, and I would encourage everybody to ask him that question when he's here um, later this weekend. Um, but that is moving ahead as well. On East Med, I'll say three things. First of all, at a strategic level, it's an extremely important project that the United States strongly supports. It complements everything that we've been doing with the three plus one, our support for the flourishing uh, Greece-Israel relationship. Um, the market is going to decide whether the pipeline is constructed. Obviously, um, the discoveries that ExxonMobil announced yesterday um, will have a positive impact on those market calculations. But certainly at the political level, as Ambassador Friedman, my counterpart in Jerusalem, made clear when he participated in the last Greece-Israel-Cyprus trilateral, the United States is all in. Okay, because until recently, I remember a few years back, the U.S. was even, I would say, off the record, sometimes on, uh, supporting more the possibility that the pipeline would go through Turkey. Our support Although private companies do their decision, but still you could feel at the State Department and elsewhere that that's the shortest, the cheapest, you could, you know what I'm saying. I yeah. mean, but this is not the case anymore, maybe because developments in Turkey itself have changed the equation. I don't know. And the three plus one. The, the, the deepening of the Greece-Israel relationship is a very important factor here. The fact that you had a member of the Israeli cabinet speaking to us last night at Delphi is, is an important signifier. I would also, the other project which we haven't talked about, and I should, is the FSRU in Alexandropoli. Again, particularly important to unlocking that Balkan energy island and expanding opportunities for exports into Greece of LNG. Uh, we're very hopeful that the FSRU also will move ahead. Um, Gas Trade, the consortium lead, had a successful market test um, a few weeks ago, and we, we will continue to work hard to support that as well, which is interesting because it, it fits, it, it nests within several other projects in Alexandropoli. Uh, the, the port privatization, in which we have American company interest, uh, the privatization of the Agnatia Odos, uh, where we don't have American interest, but others are, and perhaps most importantly, the strategic importance of um, Eastern Macedonia and Thrace in the context of the larger U.S. strategy for the Balkans and the larger Black Sea region. Well, you mentioned the three plus one, and we have Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and the U.S. seems to be getting more involved. There is some preparation for another summit. We used to this, we, we as Greeks are used to these summits 
uh, between the prime ministers of the three countries. The next one will be in Crete. May, March, April, uh, is there a possibility that uh, Secretary Pompeo might uh, participate? Are we at a point where, because there was some thought about that, I'm not sure if... Uh... So this was a part of the conversation between Secretary Pompeo and Minister Katruglos in December, and my boss, the Secretary of State, made clear that he intends to participate in the three plus one. It's a logistics question now in terms of figuring out where and when we make it happen. Um, but I'm very confident that the policy is clear and it's just a matter of working the, the mechanics. Okay, that's kind of newsy. It's nice to know that uh, you also, through this, these discussions, you get something uh, new out there. Um, you always talk about the strategic relationship, alliance, partnership. Can we be a little bit more specific? Because to be honest, I hear a lot of friends, not politicians, you know, simple people, who like on a certain level the fact that uh, Greece has a good relationship with the US. Uh, it's a little bit surprising in a positive way that it has such a close relationship with the leftist oriented government. But I think that's a part of matur maturization or maturity of the political system in Greece. But can we be a little bit more specific? What are the benefits of Greece? according to you, of course, uh, through that or from that uh, strategic alliance uh, on defense and other areas. I mean, uh, it's one thing to say, you know, I remember in 2005, Condi Rice first mentioned strategic relationship with Petros Moriviatis, then foreign minister, and we were all happy in a way, but they tried to analyze it, and we didn't know in specific tangible terms what it means. What does it mean, a strategic relationship or so, partnership? I mean, uh, no. Tom, I think first and foremost, that's a question you have to put to the Greek government. What I will say is the following. First of all, every American who comes to Greece appreciates the complicated strategic geography of this neighborhood. And if there's one thing that I've learned through 30 years as an American diplomat, it's that geography trumps philosophy, um, that geography matters. Um, Greece lives in a complicated neighborhood vis-a-vis your large neighbor to the east, but also a complicated neighborhood vis-a-vis -vis North Africa and the Maghreb, the refugee problem, vis-a-vis -vis the Eastern Med, which as I said, I'm always struck when Admiral Fogo talks about this, about how when he was a young naval officer cruising around the Mediterranean, it was basically a lake cruise for the US Navy. Now you have an aggressive Russian naval presence in the Eastern Mediterranean, a Russian base at Tartus, the expansion of the Russian footprint at, uh, at in Crimea, in occupied Crimea, and leveraging that to project power and influence into the wider neighborhood. Um, but Russia is not the only part of the story. So in this complicated region, um, we, the United States, view Greece as a pillar of stability. I mean, that was the phrase that Secretary Pompeo used when he was with Minister Katrugalos. I think, and here again, I don't want to speak for the Greek government, but I think Greek people that I engage with see the United States presence as reassuring. That's why when I was in Alexandropoli um, a few months ago talking to the mayor, um, he was extremely enthusiastic about the fact that we were rotating American helicopter forces through Alexandropoli. Um, not because he was a big fan of NATO, but because he saw the American presence as reassuring. It is sending a confidence building message to investors, to the international community at a moment in time when there are other reasons um, which uh, encourage anxiety. Speaking of anxiety and other reasons, how do you assess Turkish policy these days towards Greece? And also the development we had here in our domestic politics with the new defense minister, a lot of uh, low-key people think that uh, Mr. Apostolakis is, is somebody who can work better with the Turks, but uh, I'm just wondering what your assessment is. And of course, the CBMs that they seem to are be working on, if because since you mentioned your previous presence, presence here, three years was it, or two years? You mentioned your anxiety about a possibility of, uh, I don't know, how should I call it, hot incident in the Aegean or an accident. Are we in a better place these days? I think we are. I, let me start with Minister Apostolakis, who I would emphasize has the highest respect from his counterparts in the Pentagon, 
There was a very good letter that was just sent from um, Acting Secretary of Defense Shanahan just the other day following up their conversations at the last NATO Defense Ministerial. He's also highly regarded as a soldier uh, by his counterparts, General Scaparati, General Dunford, um, Admiral Fogo. That counts for a lot. But there's also tremendous appreciation in Washington for the efforts that Minister Apostolakis has made to open a clear channel of communications with Minister Akar. And at the end of the day, these are two NATO allies. And for the United States, a paramount objective is to ensure that Greece and, and Turkey are NATO allies in fact and are able to behave as such. Um, you talked about two years ago. What I remember was one year ago, um, and uh, uh, this morning, this very morning, about w two o'clock on the Friday morning of the Delphi Forum, my, I got a knock on my door, and it was my guys informing me that two Greek soldiers had been, uh, had been taken on the Turkish border. So a reminder that it wasn't that long ago when there were a lot of points of irritation. Uh, you had the collision, um, uh, the collisions of, uh, of vessels, the activities of the Turkish Coast Guard vessel, um, it's, very, it's a very positive development um, that Minister Apostolakis is so strongly focused on this. Also appreciate the fact that the foreign ministers um, and um, uh, Secretary General Parskovopoulos are working on the CBM's agenda again. I remember when I was getting ready for this job, I had lunch with Ambassador Reese and Charlie gave me a RAND paper on Aegean CBMs and said, why don't you take this and keep it on your shelf? There may be an opportunity to work on it at some point. I've still got it on the shelf, Charlie. Um, but uh, we, are, we are hopeful that the process that the Prime Minister um, and President Erdogan agreed to um, last month in Ankara will make it possible to revive some of those conversations as well. And then I think also extremely, extremely important both the imagery, but also the practical impact of the Prime Minister's trip to Istanbul, his visit to the Halki Seminary. Um, if the United States American policy has been very clear on our support for the ecumenical patriarch, the important role that the church plays and that the patriarch plays as part of the West, um, reopening Halki is part of strengthening the ecumenical patriarch's hand in the existential battle that is now underway uh, between the Church of Constantinople and the Moscow Church and Patriarch Krill. So very, very important as well. While we are on Turkey, and this is about Greece and US, but just a brief analysis from your part on uh, the president of Turkey. Uh, it's, it's a big issue for the world, not only the, the Greeks, the European Union, the US. Should we trust Mr. Erdogan? And that, of course, has repercussions for all the other things you mentioned, from Cyprus to uh, uh, the Balkans. To, he seems to be building a lot of mosques in the area with all due respect to Islam. He is doing it, so there might be some other ideology behind it. So uh, how are you assessing? Uh, so, so let me just say two issues. In the context of, our, of American strategy in Southeastern Europe, um, Greece and the United States see eye to eye. In fact, we probably see closer eye to eye than we, the United States, do with almost any other NATO partner in terms of our shared interest in seeing that Turkey remains anchored in the West, um, in working through the difficult issues that both of our governments have. We, we are a, a very difficult moment still in US-Turkish relationship. I would also note that I'm very pleased that um, David Satterfield, one of our most senior and most respected ambassadors, has been nominated to serve in, um, in Ankara. He has a more difficult job than I do, um, just like John Bass had a more difficult job than I did, and it's been a long time without an American ambassador there. So leave it at that. Um, and last point on Turkey, not internal Turkish uh, developments. Are you worried about things, developments in the uh, Cypriot EZ, because a lot of times we talk about the Aegean, about the islands, miles, which is real, but it's also theoretical. In the case of Cyprus, we, it seems, and we hope, we're talking about a lot of money. If there's gas and the more there is, the more money there is. And Turkey is a big country with energy needs. And um, actually I was recently with a Turkish diplomat talking about it, and he said openly that we're not going to let this thing go away because there's a lot of gas, as it seems. Uh, he didn't specify what he will do or what his country will do, so are you worried about 
You have ExxonMobil there, which is an American company. H how are you viewing the situation? I, I think we have time. Um, it's going to be a long process for ExxonMobil now to follow up its preliminary findings um, to determine the, uh, the full scope of the resources that are available and then to decide, and they have yet to decide, whether to invest the billions of dollars that will be required to both extract the gas and then bring it to market. They have to decide, do they, is there enough gas to justify an LNG facility in Cyprus? Do they take it to Egypt? Do they plug it into the East Med? And that, in turn, is affected by global market trends. Um, so this, this is an issue that is going to unfold over a matter of years and decades, not weeks. Um, in the meantime, we welcome the fact that President Anastasiades has endorsed the concept of an escrow fund or a, uh, a sovereign fund that would ensure that the, um, the revenues, if they have ever come from any offshore exploration, will be equitably shared uh, with the communities. So I think, I, you know, I come back to my point about Greek-Turkey relations, our support for the dialogue that's underway, and our interest in seeing that all of these matters are managed uh, professionally and in a way that reinforces regional stability. Moving away from Turkey, uh, the Balkans, you mentioned the Prespas Agreement. Can you assess the situation in the Balkans, the role of Greece, given what has happened with the agreement? So I think the two things that are most impressive to me, one is, and I, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Foreign Minister Dimitrov earlier this morning. One thing that's impressive to me is um, the appetite among the countries of the Western Balkans for Greece's engagement. Again, Greece is back. And for understandable reasons, through the better part of a decade, Greece was preoccupied with its internal financial and economic situation and didn't have the bandwidth for an actively engaged forward policy in the Western Balkans. Moving forward, the United States and Greece have exactly congruent interests. We wish to see all of the countries of the Western Balkans continue on the path towards the Euro-Atlantic community, uh, continue to move towards European standards of reform. It's a long and difficult process. I'm highly confident that somebody from Athens or Thessaloniki is better positioned to help with that process than a bureaucrat sitting in Brussels. So I think we, we the United States, see Greece as um, a preferred partner for the U.S in working with Europe and working with European institutions on all of this. And then I, I, I also think, and I, this comes, I've probably spent, Charlie will correct me if I'm, I'm misstating, I think I've spent more time in Thessaloniki and Northern Greece than any American ambassador you know, in several generations. And a lot of that time has been spent with Greek companies. Um, a lot of it, my energy has been, been spent pushing back on the malign presence of Russia. Um, and the, the negative effect that Russia has had on issues like the church, on, 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 um, on transparency. Um, but I, I am also struck among my friends in the, the business community. I spoke to Thanasis earlier this morning, and he'll be, speaking, um, he'll be speaking later in the conference. I think everybody in Thessaloniki in the business community recognizes that it has been too long, that there's been an artificial barrier between Greece and its northern neighbors. And the Prespice Agreement is what demolished that, uh, that artificial barrier and creates the opportunity for, um, for Greek businesses to begin thinking regionally. And I come back to TIF. Again, the reason that Simos and I were successful in marketing the Thessaloniki International Fair is precisely because we were able to present it as an opportunity not just to address the market in Thessaloniki or the market in Greece, but in the wider region. And I think especially for Thessaloniki, that's key to future prosperity. Thank you. Now that you mentioned Prespas, the Prespas guy from our side seems to be there. No. There's former minister Kotsias and Thanasis. <laughs> I think they, and they can both speak better than I can to, to the, the, bene, the economic benefits of their agreement. Thank you very much. I have to be honest, I was worried a little bit when you mentioned that somebody came and knocked on your hotel door, the room at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was looking at your wife a little bit worried, <laughs> but at least it was the Turkey and the army, the yeah. soldiers seat you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I apologize to the organizers for, uh, as I'm told, we went a few minutes over time. Thanks, Thank Tom. You. I look forward to doing it again.